In this brief video, we're going to talk about web scraping considerations. The first consideration is about data ethics. So there is a question of can you scrape the web? And then there's the question of should you scrape the web? And not necessarily web overall, but about particular uh, data sources. So I wanna uh, go over this case study very briefly. Um, this is an article from Vox.com uh, titled, Researchers Just Released Profile Data on 70,000 OkCupid Users Without Permission. So this is a case from 2016. And um, what this group of researchers did was to go to the database for, or the webpage for OkCupid, which is an online dating site, and they scraped the data. And the article says, the data dump breaks the cardinal rule of social science research et ethics. It took identifiable personal data without permission. Now, in defense, the researchers said that uh, the data is already public. We did not do anything wrong. But if you read through this article, what you're going to find out is that um, while the real names of the users are not available in the data set that they released, the usernames are. And some people use their real, user, uh, real names as their username. Some people might also use the same username in other uh, places where it would be associated with their real name as well. And sure, these people have chosen to do this. These people have chosen to give their uh, personally identifiable information to this webpage, to OkCupid, but for a particular purpose uh, to, you know, to be in the dating pool. Not necessarily so their information can be released as a data set to the public in a much more searchable manner. So this is a consideration of perhaps legally at the time, the researchers did not necessarily do something wrong, but ethically that was wrong. And there are many instances of cases like this where we're thinking about data ethics versus the legality of things. And given that a lot of these technologies are new, we're often finding ourselves in a situation where um, perhaps the law has not necessarily caught up with the um, ethics or the technology, or also perhaps there isn't really enough said or done about the data uh, ethics of certain things. And there, this is uh, certainly a growing area of research, uh, thinking about data science ethics, ethics of machine learning, ethics of artificial intelligence. These are all things actually we're going to talk about in the class next week when, uh, in our data ethics module. But I wanted to bring this up as both a cursor to what we're going to be talking about and also because it's timely for the unit that we're covering. We are teaching you in this unit how to get data from the web. Um, and we're focusing for now mostly on the technical aspect of things, but that cannot exist in a faunus without the other considerations that come with the data, the real data that we're uh, scraping. The other challenges that we might talk about are a little bit more on the technical side. First of all, we might be dealing with unreliable formatting at the source of the data. So the examples we've seen so far, we were getting data out of IMDB, which is curated by the company IMDB, right? It's not really um, user entry there. And, um, and so it's very structured. And we were looking at these really structured pages of like top 250 movies, for example. But here's a screenshot from Gumtree where uh, people are selling, you know, motor vehicles and stuff like that. And you can see that some of the postings have pictures and some of them don't. Um, if you take a look at the second and the third post there, um, we both know the year the vehicle was made and how many miles it has. But the first, uh, the second entry, uh, this uh, highlighted one um, says it's a trade versus the third one doesn't say it's not a trade. So we're assuming that when it doesn't say it's trade, that it's for sale instead. Um, but we don't have that exact parity. So if we're using these CSS selectors to match whether the post um, or the listing is for trade or for sale, we're actually not going to have that other information. We probably can write some logic around it, but this sort of thing makes uh, web scraping challenging when you have this sort of unreliable formatting at the source. Another thing might be that your data might be broken into many pages. Here I've gone to Yelp and looked for vegetarian food in Edinburgh, for example, and Yelp uh, produces the search results show you only 10 uh, 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 listings at a time. 10 results at a time. And then the results are spread across many pages. So in order to scrape from these, you need to write some logic around that. And we'll talk a little bit about that um, 
when we talk about functionalizing things and iteration, but that's yet another challenge when your data that you're trying to get is not all on one page. Um, there are also some workflow considerations that we should talk about. Um, first of all, this is something we mentioned at the very beginning of this module on web scraping, but I want to reiterate it one more time. There are two different scenarios of web scraping. And the first one is screen scraping, which is what we've been doing. We're extracting data from the source code of the website, and we're not doing it manually ourselves through regular expression matching, but instead we're using this HTML parser through the Arvest package. So it's called screen scraping, and I've kind of been broadly calling what we're doing web scraping, but what we're doing is really a subset of web scraping. The other uh, part of the story is using web API, so application programming interfaces, where the website offers a set of structured HTTP requests that re return either JSON or XML files. We're not going to cover this in the class, but the reason why I'm mentioning this is that sometimes when you want to scrape data from a web page and you check to see, am I allowed to do that? You might get the result false, but actually if you look, the website might make available an API. And so the website provider might be saying, we don't want you doing screen scraping. We don't want you hitting our servers in that manner. Instead, we have provided this web API for you where you can make these structured requests. Now, obviously, if you run into that in the context of this course, this is not something we've taught you. Although if you're wanting to do that for your project, um, I'd be happy to walk through it with you. Uh, but importantly, it's uh, it's use not only useful, but important to respect how the website provider wants you to access the data they're making available, if at all. And if so, if they're making a web API available, yes, it does require uh, learning uh, something new, but actually once you do learn it, you'll see that the results are a lot more reliable because the data comes back to you in a structured format, and then it is not on you to try to parse the information that you need out. Um, another one is about a workflow around R. So when we're so far, we've been working in R Markdown documents. And when working in an R Markdown document and you hit knit, your analysis is rerun each time you knit. If web scraping in an R Markdown document, you'd be rescraping the data each time you knit, which is unreliable and also not nice. You're constantly hitting their servers. And also importantly, that data might change and maybe you don't want that. Maybe you want a snapshot at a particular point uh, for your web scraping results. So we're going to present an alternative workflow this week. We're going to use an R script instead of an R Markdown document to save your code. And then we're going to at the end, use this R script to fetch the data from the web and then save it as either a CSV file or an RDS file. Both of the things we've learned about when we learned about reading data in and writing data out. And then we're going to use the save data in our analysis that we're going to do in our R Markdown document. So, so far in this class, you had that CSV file provided to you or you downloaded it from somewhere, and then you used it. Now we're actually putting together that data frame and saving it as a CSV or an RDS file. And then your workflow is the same for your analysis. Read it in at top of your R Markdown document and go through the analysis. So what we don't want to repeat each time we knit is the rescraping part, but we do certainly want our the rest of our analysis to be reproducible via the R Markdown document.